Welcome to another episode of Tiffin Box TV. I speak with photography industry leaders who make it a habit of inspiring others, bridging craft and commerce to help you create a sustainable and creative business. Today's guest is Peter Wright, Pete Wright, actually, a, a photographer and an author who's just written a book called Cinematic Portraits, and he's going to be coming to Connecticut to teach about cinematic portraits. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled about having him on the show only because uh, I took a look at his work and I've completely fallen in love with it. Uh, it's a, a very unique way of looking at uh, creating these really dramatic portraits and I wanted to talk to him about what he's going to be teaching us at this workshop on June 22nd in Connecticut. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Seishu. Um So it is Pete. And yes, I want to make sure Pete. it is it is Pete, right? Uh, Unless you're mad at me, which does happen <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> no one's mad at you right now, Pete. Good, good. <laughs> uh, talk to us a little bit about your background, because one of the things I love to know about is how people get started. Uh, what is it that gets you going in the mornings for photography for your business? So, give us a little s synopsis of how you got your how you got your start. Sure. Well, so my father was a minister, and anybody that knows anything about ministers knows ministers have lots of hobbies. Uh, my father's two hobbies were photography and tennis, and he took both of them very, very seriously. Uh, so ironically, uh, those are kind of my two hobbies, my two things in life. I played tennis since I was about six, played tennis in college, taught tennis professionally for a number of years, and still to this day play tennis as often as I can in leagues and stuff like that. Um, and then my other passion in life is photography. And, I, you know, I, I started at a very young age with photography. I, I think it was maybe 10 or 11. My father gave me my first camera because I was begging him to have one so that I could be on the other side of the camera rather than being the subject of all of his photos. Uh, and my father would go out on little escapades. He, he loved capturing landscapes and scenics. And he would get up at the crack of dawn to capture the sunrise coming across a certain type of flower that he liked or a barn setting with an old tractor breaking down and things like that. And I would go with him and and really enjoyed it. And we lived in a small town called St. Paul's, North Carolina, only 2,000 people in this town. Uh, and it was one of those where everybody knows everybody. And one of the, 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 the town photographer, it was interesting, if, if you – most, if you've been in the photography industry for a while, uh, photographers in the 70s, 80s, even earlier, uh, back then they were respected the same way as the town doctor, the town lawyer, the town dentist. You usually had a town photographer. And he was also a tennis player and a good friend of my father's. And for a long time, uh, we would go and use his dark room. And eventually my father built his own dark room. We built it together and had this amazing dark room. So I grew up. Uh, with my dad going out, taking photos, printing and processing our own images. And at the age of 14, I got my first paying job for the town newspaper in this town of 2000. Um, I was writing and photographing for the newspaper, and I was so young they had to pay me under the table. Uh, but that's kind of where I got my start. Uh, I found out at a very early age that I was allergic to color chemicals, thus the fact my fascination with black and white. Ah, um, wow. In fact, they did a study on me. My mother worked at a uh, medical training facility called uh, Area Health Education Center in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And uh, she took me in because I had broken out in hives. And they took me in and determined that I had a reaction to these color chemicals. And they did a study in some medical journal on me when I was like 11 or 12 years old on my reaction to this because they'd never heard of that before. So now I was – we later found out that I was allergic to – and I can't remember what it was, but a certain color chemical that you would use in home processing. But I wasn't allergic to C41 chemicals uh, as I had worked in a color lab years, years, years and years later and never had any reactions to that. But right. it kind of forced me down the path of black and white, and I studied black and white photography a ton. So Awesome. Oh, and how did you pursue black and white photography? Was it just something where you – force yourself to use black and white film and process it at home with your dad or is it something that you went to a workshop for or what, now, how, did, you know, how did you get to start there i didn't take classes 
for okay. photography until okay. I started my business. Wow. Because I just always did it. I guess my father was my teacher yeah. and, you know, experience was my teacher. Uh, so and my father passed away when I was 17. So I didn't, oh, wow. uh, I, I didn't do photography for about six years after he passed away. But up until then, it's like I had a full blown hands on course in, in black and white photography. Yeah. And, you know, it's when, when I worked for the newspaper or when I shot pretty much anything, uh, the newspaper back then was all black and white anyway. So that's right. Y- you had to know when you were capturing something something for the newspaper, you had to know the tonality of how it was going to reproduce in the paper. Uh, it, it's not just as easy as going and capturing something that's going to be a nice black and white image. Sometimes something that would print really well in the dark room won't print really well on print mm-hmm. for a newspaper. So you had to understand tonality a little bit differently and contrast and things like that uh, just so that your captures would reproduce well there. So it's kind of a lesson in in the way you capture black and white at a very, very young age. It's different now because very rarely do you see newspapers, and when you do, they're <laughs> usually right. color newspapers. USA Today is a color newspaper, right. uh, but today's every everything is web-based, so... Uh, and, and very rarely do you hear about anybody going into a dark room. We're we're talking on our modern dark room right now. So that's right, absolutely. Uh, between the time uh, your father passed and the time you you came back to photography again, what inspired you to get back to into photography? Um, so I got back into photography at the age of twenty three. So that's a little over 20 years ago now. And at the time I was dating my current wife, uh, had probably just proposed to her and was teaching, uh, was a head, head, head tennis pro at a, a racket club in North Carolina. And the thing about tennis is it's very seasonal. So, you know, when it's cold outside, nobody's taking tennis lessons, nobody's playing tennis. Ironically enough, I went from one seasonal industry to another in <laughs> weddings, you know. And you don't but you don't know that when you're entering you're like, "Hey, I'll, right. I'll just switch careers and I'll become a photographer." Um I had a an opportunity to go work for a local lab and camera store in Greenville, North Carolina called ASAP, which is still there, great professional camera store and lab. Um, they do a lot of workshops there. So if anybody's ever in Greenville, North Carolina, I don't live anywhere near there, but I know they do a lot of great educational stuff. At any rate, I had an opportunity to go work there and, uh, they sold pro gear. They had a studio in the back. They printed and processed images in one hour. They did just a little bit of everything. And so I literally just took the job, not with the expectation of becoming a career photographer, but with the expectation of just earning money to pay my bills a little bit more steadily than tennis was at the time. Um, But while I was there, about six months after I had started there, a friend of mine managed a company called Ritz Camera locally, and I'm sure most people have heard of Ritz. Uh, At the time, which a lot of people don't know, at the time Ritz Camera had studios in all their stores, and you could actually go and have family portraits taken at Ritz. And Ritz made a corporate-wide decision, hey, we're we're not going to do portraits in the studios anymore. We're going to just dump everything. And they gave this manager permission just to sell all the gear. And we had become friends. He said, hey, Ritz Camber decided not to do this. Are you interested in buying the studio gear that we have here? I'm like, sure. What have you got? He said, well, I've got a set of lights, backgrounds, background stands, stands wow. for the lights, everything. I'm like, well, how much do you want for it? 250 bucks. Oh, my goodness. I could not pull my checkbook out quick enough. Here, here's the check. I'll, t- wow. I'll take it all. Uh, so I did that and bought that, set up a studio, Got a, had a studio apartment that – wasn't that uh, that I set up? I got a studio apartment that I set up as a uh, studio. Uh, probably not the best th- way to do things now, if you look at zoning and everything. But I was right out of college, so I knew nothing. I'm like, hey, studio apartment, studio makes sense. I've got one room where I can set up a studio, another room where clients can change clothes, and a little area that we can sit, meet, and talk. Uh, but the exact same person that sold me the stuff from Ritz Camera also introduced me to East Carolina University's sports information director. 
And at the same time I was starting up my own studio business at doing portraits and weddings, I became East Carolina University's primary sports photographer, shooting all of their events all over the country, all their coaches' headshots, teams' headshots, team shots. It was really a major lesson in photography for me in that I had to do everything, there you go. whether it was a studio portrait, whether it was a family portrait showing the coach's family, or whether it was action. And that, I would say, might have been one of the most critical moments <clears throat> in my photography career. Uh, and, and most people would say, well, sports photography was critical in your career as a cinematic photographer. There was a gentleman named Norm Riley who passed away just a couple of months ago of cancer who was kind of a mentor to me. He wasn't a photographer, but he was very critical, and he always pushed me to do more and better than I thought I could. So I would go out and shoot a game, and I'm like, oh, I got some gems here. I got these great images, and I'd come up, and he would just pick them apart. And I would get so mad. I'm like, you're not a photographer. What do you know? And I wouldn't say this to him, but I would just mm. – I'd leave just – so aggravated so I'd go out the next week and I'd just nail it I'd get better shots and I'd come back and every week I thought I was going to get better and better and better and show up with these shots and that that was finally going to be the one and he'd always be complimentary but he would always find fault and what that drove me to do was to never be satisfied and never ever capture an image saying, I'm done. That's it. I've gotten as good as I can get. It, it made me see that no matter how good of an image I capture, I can always do better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, years later, he moved from East Carolina University and I moved from Virginia and he was uh, the SID at uh, Tulane University. No, I'm sorry, UAB. And every time he had a game nearby, he would actually call me and say, Pete, I'd love it if you'd come out and photograph. And we became friends later on, you know, a decade later. Uh, just through that and you know it was at that time that I was able to acknowledge to him how important he was in my abilities as a photographer to always try to be better than what I was at the time so fantastic wow great it's wonderful to have a, a mentor almost outside of the industry mm -hmm. uh, because their perspective is so pure in a way <laughs> you know right it is um, so thanks for thanks for sharing that story with us uh, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be bringing to us uh, to our, to your workshop in Connecticut on June 22nd for sure. CTPPA. Yeah, the 22nd and the 23rd. I'm That's really right. excited exactly. about this. Two days or a day yeah, and a half. Yeah, initially you were going to do only a three-hour uh, workshop, I remember, and, and then uh, Marietta emailed me and said, no, 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 he's coming for a day and a half. And so tell us, fill us in on all the exciting things that we can expect well, I, I never knew I was only doing three hours. That would have been great. I, oops, I, <laughs> From the moment I talked to her, it was a day and a half. So, oh, was it? Okay. Which is okay. fine with me. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it's exciting. Maybe I got the information wrong, so. No, no, you had it right. It probably was three hours, and then she said, oh, well, we can get Pete for free. Let's make it work for a day and a half. So, um, you know, I'm very fortunate and blessed that I work for Canon, and Canon is a huge supporter. Uh, I'm in a unique position uh, that's a little different than the typical Canon employee. I've lectured for over a decade. I've spoken at WPPI eight times, Imaging USA four times, just about every state. Uh, wow. I've spoken in London, the Philippines, Bermuda, uh, just Grand Cayman. I'm trying to remember all the different. I've spoken all over the world. A couple of books out, and uh, so education is a big part of my past. And when Canon came to me and hired me to work for their uh, large format print division, they said, "Look, a big part of why we wanted you here is because of the educational background you have, and we want you to continue speaking. Uh, and we don't want you to just go out and pimp our product and and be a walking advertisement, but we want you to incorporate the importance of finishing your own image uh, in, in what people do. And to me, that's kind of a lost right. It was part of my message anyway uh, in that photographers have kind of lost that and they don't understand that uh, finishing your art or not finishing your art at least at some level, would be the equivalent of Van Gogh doing an entire painting and then sending it to somebody else and letting them sign it for him. You know, it, it's if you finish your own work, then you you have a better understanding of the flaws you have as a photographer on the front end. Uh, a lot of times what we do is we take images, we send them to a lab, 
and those images are flawed, but then the lab goes through and makes them look fantastic and sends them back to us, and we think, wow, I did a really good job on this, but what we don't realize is the lab did a really good job on this. However, if you're finishing your own images, you're printing your own images, when they come off the printer, you see flaws and areas of mistakes that you've made, then you make adjustments on the front end as a photographer, and you and you become a better photographer. You grow and you become a more complete artist. So all of my programs now are going to be what I call full circle programs, whether it's a macro photography program, a posing and lighting cinematic photography program, a wedding photography program, print competition program, whatever my pro, whichever programs I give, uh, they'll be full circle. They'll talk about the front end with the capture, the middle part, which is the processing, and the back end, which is the output. So we're going to be in that the area where photographers get a more complete education. So when I come to Connecticut, which I can't wait, I, you know, I've been all around Connecticut. I've yet to actually speak in Connecticut. So it's one of those little check marks off the <laughs> states that I've spoken in. Yeah, uh, I think we're starting off in the morning from 10 to noon. Uh, we're going to do print competition, print judging. So I'll be judging and uh, critiquing work, which I love to do. I've been judging for years and years and years. I chair it. Uh, I've chaired at many states and I chair at WPPI and have uh, judged just about every level you could imagine. Then uh, right after that, we're going to take a break for lunch. We're going to do a lecture portion where we're going to talk about every aspect and element you could imagine of cinematic photography. And the nice thing is uh, when we talk about cinematic photography, we're talking about 20s and 30s style, George Harrell style photography. However, a lot of what I'll be discussing is just general rules of photography, posing, lighting patterns, uh, just understanding feminine and masculine posing, broad and short lighting, just a lot of things that regardless of what type of photography you're doing, uh, what the genre is, you need to understand these rules to help you become a better photographer. Uh, but we'll be going into some marketing aspects. Uh, so I try to make all of my programs, especially the lecture part portion, uh, ones that have things that you can apply to any type of photography. Uh, but if you want to be specific to a sp to what I'm doing, then it's even better. So, uh, so we're going to do that for, I think, three hours, which, you know, every time I do this lecture, I go over. So I, I actually gave us a cushion. I worked out with Marietta to have a little bit of a cushion. So we're actually going one to four. But dinner's scheduled from 5 to 6. So there's that one little mystery hour there that everybody's like, wait, what's happened from 4 to 5? Well, that's a lot. That's for me to be able to go over if I need to go over. Oh, uh, cool. And if we finish early, we get a two-hour dinner. If we don't, then, you know, we can keep on going. But it just gives me that little bit of a cushion. Awesome. Uh, and then we're going to come back after dinner. And we've got this beautiful model that's been arranged, and we're going to photograph. Uh, I think people are bringing their cameras. We're going to take some great images of her, and uh, we'll, we'll go through everything that we just talked about in the lecture with the posing and lighting. I'm bringing you some great props and some great backgrounds and jewelry and wardrobe. And we're, we're going to go to town and make some photos. And then the next day, uh, we're going to get everybody that – photographed to bring their laptops or their computers with them, bring the images that they captured, and we're going to spend time post-processing those images. And I, Canon is sending me a Pro 1000, brand new printer, 12 ink printer that's amazing, uh, sending it up, and we're going to print images. So wow. everybody can come in. Uh, we'll, they can work their images and learn how I do my post-processing, and then output images to take home with them. So what a it's win. Yes, that sounds exciting. And we're going to have Ellen Chrome uh, on site oh, as wow. well as Ilford. Uh, Ellen Chrome is uh, my friends at Mac Group who uh, support us through Ellen Chrome are bringing all the lighting that we're going to be photographing. And they're going to stay on site while we're shooting, which is fantastic. So if if we have a lot of people photographing and they have questions and I'm busy, they can just grab Alan from Mac Groups and ask him the same questions, and he'll be able to answer them. And then, like I said, uh, Ilford will be there as well, uh, providing us with uh, media to print on. So Awesome. Well, that sounds so exciting. I mean, really, it sounds like a, the most comprehensive experience one could expect or even wish for. Uh, as you said, it's a full circle experience that you're trying to provide other other photographers who are starting to either get into this or have been doing this for a while and know people like George Harrell. I mean, if you 
most he's people, my, he's my hero. I love uh, George. I, uh, right. I mean, most people probably don't even know who he is right now. Unfortunately, yeah, you, know? you know what? If you're coming to see me, yeah, you better do know. Google image search for George, George Harrell, H U R R E L L. I, I own every book about him or from him. I have every one of his books and I study his work and I'm telling you his command of posing and lighting is really the foundation for what we do today as portrait photographers, studio portrait photographers in particular. A lot of what we do is based on his work and you can look at his work and just say this is how I want to pose and just get an image in your head, go out and recreate that. It's such a good educational tool. Fantastic. Speaking of books, uh, Pete, you've got two books out so far um, I do. and you're working on other books as well tell us a little bit about uh, the first book which I think is ties in very well with uh, there you go cinematic there it is. cinematic portraits uh, cinematic portraits it's published by Amherst if, if I imagine yes. right correctly um, so tell us a bit about the book tell us about your second book and tell us about your future projects so the first book, Cinematic Portraits, uh, How to Create a Classic Hollywood Portrait uh, ph uh, Photography, uh, it's almost kind of a study guide for the class that I'll be doing in Connecticut. Everything that I'll be talking about in my lecture portion is right out of this book. So uh, it, it's it's a deal at 35 bucks uh, online, and I'll have a handful of copies with me if anybody wants to buy one signed. I think I maybe only have three or four copies that I can bring with me. Unfortunately, I'm running low. But... Uh, so anybody that comes in and says, man, I really love this. I love the information he covered. This is a good opportunity to take a guide for that home. It covers all the posing, the lighting, the marketing, uh, products and items that you can sell, all, just every element of it. It's basically 128 pages of pure information on, awesome. on the genre. Uh, the next book that's coming out in July, my wife and I actually co-authored. It's uh, Wedding Kickstart. And that book is basically uh, a marketing-related book to wedding photography, and it's kind of a two-system book. Uh, on one hand, it's a great book if you're just getting into wedding photography and you're looking for all the, the knowledge that you need to start a photography business. It's great for that. It tells you everything you could possibly need to know. But it's also for the advanced photographer that's been in business for 15, 20 years and feels like, man, I'm kind of in a rut I need to find a new outlet, a new way to market my business because I'm just not getting the brides I want anymore or I feel like I've been doing the same things for a long time and they're just not working anymore. This book has tons of great marketing ideas for ways to make yourself stand out and for ways to make sure that you're getting the right bride. In the book and in general, I liken our style of marketing to fishing, which is ironic. I live right by the Gulf and love to fish. But – you know, there's two kinds of fishermen. There's the guy that goes out with a casting net, and he throws a net out having no idea what he's going to get, but he knows he's going to get back a lot of little fish. But he's going to work really hard because he's constantly throwing that net out, constantly throwing it out and bringing it back in, and it's just kind of a, I hope I get something good. Then there's the fisherman that goes out wanting a very specific fish, so he takes a very specific rod with a very specific line with a very specific bait and throws it to a very specific spot to catch exactly what he wants. And that's the marketing technique that we always used. We had a very specific bride that we wanted, and it's true of all of our business. We have a specific client that we want, and we do the things we need to target that specific client. So the wedding book is really a lot about that. It really teaches you how to identify the bride or the client that's ideal for you and then how to target them specifically. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, Pete, uh, the, the fact that you're coming all the way to Connecticut is a, is a, is, is such a, such a joy for me because I think it's great to have people like you uh, speak at CTPPA and be a part of CTPPA. Um, and it, it's wonderful that you're spending a whole day and a half with us. I mean, that's fantastic. I'm excited. Uh, yeah, uh, we're we're gonna learn a lot. We're gonna learn. I can tell right off the bat. We're gonna learn a lot. And, you know, being so involved in photography for such a long time, uh, you have you've got the rich experience that you bring with you as well, uh, as well as you know, obviously the skills and the craftsmanship, um, which I think is so important these days. Um, one one point that I asked about 
um, and we talked very briefly about is the fact that you are a prolific writer as well. Talk to us a little bit about your writing habit. Tell us a little bit about what, what is it that you do to commit yourself to writing about your art? Well, I come from a family of writers, so and uh, my mother was a librarian, like I said, at a medical facility, a medical training facility. My father's a minister, so he wrote sermons, and my sister uh, started out as a writer in the movie industry and is now a travel writer and has done every kind of writing you can imagine. She lives in L.A., and she's a, a career writer, so uh, the irony is I hate to read. <laughs> so really? you can ask me what the, what's the last book I read. I couldn't tell you. I cannot stand to read. I get, I, oh. I'm like a lot of people. I'll read a paragraph, get halfway through it, and realize I was daydreaming, dreaming, and drifted off, and have to go back. And so I'll read the same paragraph six times. Sometimes I'm good at comic books. I'm that guy. I'm the comic book guy. But I love to write. I love it. Um, when I worked at the newspaper when I was 14 years old. I started out as actually a writer there, uh, and I was already shooting, but I wasn't shooting. I didn't go there with the intention of becoming a photographer. I went there with the intention of writing, and when I, the reason I started photographing more for them was I got paid by the column inch, and I realized that a photograph colors a lot more, covers a lot more column inches really easily than, uh, than the writing part does, uh, but one of the things that I learned through teaching was I would often schedule myself to teach something that I was experienced in but not deeply experienced in. And what that would do was put the pressure on me to learn more about that because I have this huge fear where most people have a fear where they imagine themselves on stage naked. I imagine myself on stage not knowing what I'm talking about and it scares the bejesus out of me. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll say, you know what, I'm going to teach about cinematic photography. And I've played a little bit about with it, but I'm going to make myself learn it inside and out. I'm going to study the greats. I'm going to go out and learn everything I can about this so that when I teach it, I know what I'm talking about and I've studied it more than anybody else. Well, the same is true for writing for me. If I'm going to write a book, I, you know, oftentimes when I go in to write a book, I know 80% of what I need to know to finish that book. And I know going in, I'm going to learn 20% more than what I knew when I started mm. because there's certain things that I'm going to have to study to make sure that I'm accurate when I'm writing the book. Uh, and and that's, that's important to me. So writing on one hand, it's an opportunity for me to pass on the knowledge that I've learned you know, over more than two decades in the industry, but it's also an opportunity for me to educate myself by learning more about what it is that I'm writing about. Awesome. Um, one last question for you, Pete. Sure. Um, one of the things that that triggered this question was the fact that you mentioned George Harrell, and uh, a lot of us, uh, when we were starting out, we look up to people perhaps like George uh, or Anne Leibovitz or, you know, Love. you know, uh, just name pick a pick a name that's you know in one of the bigger magazines and you were like oh we'd love to photograph like them how do you suggest to students of photography to be inspired but not copy yeah well and that's the fun thing it, it, it's challenging but fun uh, it, it's challenging in that just about anything you can imagine has been done it, it, anything that you can imagine and then trying to imagine your own version of it it's been done so it, you know it, it's hard for photographers to go out and say oh he copied my image or that's a direct copy of mine well you know yours probably was a copy of somebody else's and you didn't even know it or maybe you did subconsciously you saw it somewhere so I, I don't get caught up in that a whole lot but what I do is I try to look at the works of the greats that are out there and sometimes when I initially am in educational mode, not in presentation, but education mode, which means um, edu the, the difference to me is when I'm in education mode, I'm looking at an image and saying, I want to learn exactly how to recreate this image. So I'm going to make an exact duplicate of that. But I'm making that for my educational purposes, not to sell, not to put on my website, not to market with, but simply to learn from. Then there's presentation mode where I say, okay, now I know how to create that image. Now let me make 
some adjustments. Let me put my own little twist on that. And sometimes it can just be a turn of the head or a slight wardrobe adjustment or even the, the venue in which you're photographing. You know, it's maybe instead of being on a solid background, it's in a room or whatever. So, you know, to me, I, I try to tell everybody, if you're photographing something, if you're in the middle of photographing a person in a studio or in a location or whatever it is, if you think you've got that image, when you think you're done, stop, take two or three steps to your left, two or three steps to your right, whichever it is, and take one more shot, just one more. And a lot of times you'll find that that two or three to the left or two or three to the right is the one that you like. And it's because you made yourself do something or squat down to the floor or get up on a ladder. Give yourself a different angle and a different perspective. Even if you know for a fact, man, I got it. I got it in the can. This is it. This is the shot. I'm done. Give yourself that one more perspective. And a lot of times you'll find, man, I wish I'd done more of that. And then you'll find that every time you go out and shoot, you'll do more and more of that. So I, every now, now every time I go out and photograph anything, I try to give myself two or three completely different perspectives so that when I get back, I have options. Awesome. Wow. Great, great, solid advice. Pete, uh, it, it was a real pleasure talking to you today. Uh, and I, I know it's great talking to you. I know the folks who are going to be at the, uh, the we workshop uh, for over the day and a half that you're going to be here in Connecticut uh, are going to thoroughly enjoy having you with them. I'm sure of it. Um, if the if my audience has any questions for you, would it be all right for for me to post those in the blog post and for you to come back and respond to them? Would that be all right? Absolutely, I will try my best. Although I know uh, I'm going to be on the road in the next couple of days, that's so right. that or they can email me. Uh, I've got a personal email address that's great. It's Pete at pwphotography.com. They can email me there, but I will definitely check your blog and try to respond there as well. Awesome. I, I know we want to try to make sure we're getting people here to see your blog post, so awesome. I, I'll try to do both. Thank you so much, Pete. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.